Good morning, my name is Bill Payne. We continue our sermon series, Do Justice, and again read from Isaiah chapter 49, verses one through seven. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my reward is with God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength, he says. Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel? I will give you as a light to the nations, and my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nation, the slave of rulers, kings shall see and stand up, princes and they shall prostrate themselves because the Lord who is faithful the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. Holy words for God's people. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Joe. I get to serve as a lead pastor here at Bothell. And it's just a joy to be together, um, to turn to one another and just say, it's good to be here. It's good to be here. Maybe share your name and then say, it's good to be here. Preferably someone you didn't come with. I see you. You know, Friday was a Korean American, National Korean American Day. Uh, it was the day we celebrate um, the legacy of Korean Americans, and uh, it's Friday, uh, J January 13. Uh, I actually did not know that this day existed until I went to this event in Edmonds, uh, and it was awesome to learn about the legacy. On J January 13, 1903, 102 Koreans uh, landed in Hawaii, and they were the first immigrants from Korea to be in the U.S., um, and so it's a really cool event that we got to celebrate and hear the legacy and share uh, and, and see different cultural moments. And what was also amazing was um, as I was there, um, I have never felt more seen or accepted than in that moment. 
And it was beautiful. It was a time to be like, oh, we see all of you. The side of you that's more American, that grew up in the States, that side of you that looks Korean and looks Asian, and all of the beauty of the complexity of all of those identities together, I was like, oh, hey, I'm here. Thanks for loving me. And it was beautiful. And what was awesome was it wasn't just Koreans or Korean Americans were in that space together. It was this beautiful community of the whole Edmonds and surrounding that we could all be in that space and recognize the beauty in one another and celebrate the diversity that we carry. And it felt good. It felt really good. And I want to name that I, I, my hope and my prayer is that we're able to create that kind of atmosphere, that kind of environment every time we gather together. When we gather in community, that we can create a space where everyone truly feels seen and welcome and belonging, that we can name for one another and to one another, I see you. Thanks for being here. Right? There's something beautiful in that. And so we want to name that you, for exactly who God created you to be, you are welcome and that you belong. And we also name, especially that there are some of you who have experienced hurt and pain from church, from community, where you've been pushed out, kept out, where you've been marginalized and oppressed. We want to name, especially for you, that you are welcome and that you belong. What that might mean is this. If you are gay or lesbian or transgender, bisexual or questioning, know without a doubt that you are welcome and that you belong. If you're black or brown or indigenous, if you've been discriminated against because of the color of your skin, know that you are welcome, know that you belong. If you're single or divorced, partnered or separated, if you find yourself homeless or houseless or in the lower economic brackets of our community, know that you are welcome, know that you belong with all of your unique gifts and abilities created to be bearers of Christ's image to all the world. Know that you are welcome, know that you belong. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Be present here, O oh God, in all the places from which we are worshiping. Move in us and through us that we too would be moved and changed. Speak to us, we pray. Less of me, more of you. None of me, all of you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I remember when I was in middle school, I, I was attending school at Jackson Township, Ohio. And our uh, year-end project for our English class was uh, to create an autobiography, uh, or a biography of one of our heroes. And uh, for me, it was, it was an opportunity to research and to develop our thoughts and form and learn all we could about people in our communities and in our history. Part of the uh, assignment was to write a series of essays and to support it with pictures and scan documents from the libraries. Uh, the other part of it was an oral presentation where we had to uh, include uh, acting out three moments of our heroes' lives as if we were in those moments, and then we were to offer some commentary and to name how uh, we feel and how those moments played out. Uh, for me, I chose the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it was this formative project for me. I learned everything I could about this remarkable man. He, he was born on January 15, 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia. He was assassinated on April 4th, 1968 in Memphis. I learned how he and his father were both named Michael King until Reverend King the senior I learned about the German monk theologian Martin Luther and so changed both him and his son's name to Martin Luther King. I learned about his call into ministry and how he was sent to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. I learned about his selection as the leader of the Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, he was chosen for a few reasons. One, because he was young. Uh, two, he wasn't threatening yet. And three, he could be a peacemaker for the uh, fighting factions uh, among this conference. I learned about his near-death experience in 1958 when he had survived a knife attack uh, in the streets in Brooklyn and, uh, and how he wrote letters from then on to uh, Dr. Thurman, Howard Thurman, a, a scholar and theologian. I learned about his travels, his, his arrest, and, and so forth. And then for, the, for my three moments for the oral presentation, I, I chose moments that Dr. King wrote about himself. The first was when he and his uh, dad, they were pulled over when he was a child. He, they were pulled over by a police officer, and he wrote how he remembers how the police officer kept calling his dad boy throughout the whole conversation. Uh, and he wrote about the second one was uh, when he, his home was bombed by a white supremacist while he was preaching at a nearby church and the sermon that he delivered after. 
Uh, and then my third uh, moment was when he delivered the now famous, I have a dream speech. And at the time, I didn't know that much about the speech itself. Uh, I would go on to learn uh, later on in life, just a couple years ago, that uh, he actually lost momentum during the speech. Um, and you can hear on recordings uh, the queen of gospel, Mahalia Jackson, from behind, who, who notices that and shouts out to him, tell him about your dream, Martin. And he puts his notes aside, and he steadies himself, and he begins, I have a dream. No, at, at that time, all, all I knew was that it was a beautiful speech from an amazing man, and so I just went on to memorize some of the excerpts. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. And I got to the last stanza. When we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all God's children, black and white, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. And I was so proud of myself for having gone through this speech with minimal mistakes. And I stood there waiting for feedback, and my teacher asked from the back of the room, do you believe in that day? She, she told me to sit down at my desk, and we, she gathered the class, and she said, do you believe in a day when all God's children will be free? I wonder if I might ask you the same question this morning. Do you believe in a day when all God's children will be free, when we can hold hands and declare free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty we are free at last? Perhaps you'll indulge me in asking one more question, assuming that your answer to the first one was yes. Yes, we believe in that day, someday when all God's children will be free. Yes, we believe in that day, even when it feels like we are moving away from that vision, even when it's hard to believe it because of the hurt and the pain that we afflict on each other in our communities and in our world. But yes, through it all, we believe in that day. If you say yes, I wonder if you would hear the second question, are we acting like it? If I was really bold and, and perhaps a bit daring, I would end my sermon here and sit down. But this morning, I'm, I'm neither of those things. <laughs> and so onwards we go. We're, we're, we're continuing the series, uh, Do Justice, as we explore who we are and what we're doing here. And, and I, I want to suggest that do justice is one of those things that we are called to do as we live into our identity, and we're, we're back in 2nd Isaiah. I, I want to name it as a reminder for us that we're in 2nd Isaiah because Isaiah is made up of three separate books written in three separate times, made up compiling Isaiah today. The first Isaiah, it's verses, uh, chapters 1 through 39, uh, is written sometime in the 8th century BCE in Jerusalem. Um, uh, Israel is autonomous. They're not governed by any other foreign nation. Um, and so the theme of these first 39 chapters is one of judgment. How do we live our lives? And it's about how they relate to those other nations. Second Isaiah, which is chapters 40 to 55, was written in the mid-6th century BCE, and they're in exile, they're in Babylon. And then third Isaiah, uh, chapters 56 to the end, was written in the early 6th century BCE, and the people are now back in Judah. 
And so in 2 Isaiah, in our text this morning, our, 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 the Israelites are in Babylon. They're in exile from everything they knew. And more importantly, they're exiled from everything that God had promised them. When God delivered the people from Egypt, God brought them to the promised land. It was, it was a place that they understood to be promised for them. And so they settled. They, they, they made lives for themselves. They, they made lives for their communities. They, and they built this temple for God, this beautiful place where God could and would reside in their midst. All of that was gone. All of that was gone. And so they wait. And they waited to hear from God again. And it's into this context that Isaiah writes. Last week, we we read that God had prepared a a servant for liberation, a a servant who would deliver justice to the people and to the world. And in our text this morning, we hear a continuation of that promise being declared. But this time, God is very clear on what the mission is. So I want to go to verse 5. In verse 5 it says, And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb, to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. Okay, I think it's important, first and foremost, to name that the primary mission of this servant is to bring the people back to God. And in this case, to return God's people back to their homes. See, Israel, they were living under what we now call royal theology. They put their faith in what we understand now to be royal theology. It was the way that they understood God's role in their lives and in their future. And royal theology was based on two things. In order for royal theology to take place, there had to be a leader, a king, that was raised up in the Davidic line, right, in the line of David. And there had to be land attached to it. So in the midst of exile, this servant who was formed in the womb, who was designed even to, to regather God's people, God's community back into right relationship with God, this servant understood two things. If the people obeyed the commandments and obeyed the laws, then God will provide the king and the land. Okay? Last week I mentioned that we could not be the servant. It would be hard for us to be the servant that's described throughout Isaiah because of our privilege that that the characteristics described in Isaiah 42 uh, did not describe us, at least not yet, but it would force us to posture ourselves with humility in order for us to perhaps be part of God's healing work of justice in the world. I want to reiterate that again. Remember the Israelites... They're receiving this prophetic word while they are living in exile. That's important. When they had lost everything, when they had lost their identity, when they have lost their perceived connection with God, that is when they receive this prophetic word. That is why Isaiah can name that the first and primary mission of the servant is to return the servant's own people back to God and to the land that God had promised. That they were in exile when they received this word makes the whole difference in the world. Because often we tie it to harmful or hurtful theology. Think about white nationalism. A claim that God's promise is for me and people like me and my community. Folks, for people in dominant cultures and classes, this is not for you. It can't be. This is a promise for people who are exiled from God and exiled from all they know, trusting that through it all, God is still faithful and that God is present and that the people would someday return into right relationship with God. Okay? But then we continue on to verse 6. And we see how that spreads from the individual to beyond. Verse 6, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivals of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. God says caring for your own is one thing, but that's not good enough. 
Caring for your own is one step in that, but it's too light a thing, for I have given you as a light to the nations, plural, to the ends of the earth. As I was reflecting on Dr. King and his legacy, I, I, I can't help think, but he also understood this. His, his, his own understanding of justice and theology evolved as he went on with his life. Uh, I'm reading this uh, collection of essays. It's called uh, Martin Luther King, The Inconvenient Hero, and it's by uh, an academic named uh, Vincent Harding. Uh, and in one of the essays, it's called Martin King, Burning Bushes and Us. Harding writes this. He says, we would like to forget that it was never the weaver of gentle, sunny dreams of freedom who was shot down on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee. Rather, it was a man who was recently described by a careful scholar in this way. In the last 12 months of his life, King represented a far greater political threat to the reigning American government than he ever had before. And it was because of this movement for Dr. King, that this is growing in Dr. King, that Hardin continues. He says, by the time of his death, peace for him was tied to new value systems, new ways of defining our personal and national needs, new disciplines of creative, mass-based, nonviolent movement. Peace was linked to the economic justice and to the radical redistribution of wealth nationally and internationally. His concern for the poor had burst the boundaries of race and nationality, transforming the meaning of the movement that he helped create. I wonder what it means for us to hear the now famous quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, while living in our bubbles of comfort without truly understanding how we are caught together in this network of care and love. What are the ways in which we are called to look to our neighbors and our siblings and our communities around us and our communities beyond us and to hear the cries of the poor? What would happen if we actually lived into that understanding? I was doing my research this week, and, and, and our church, Bothell, uh, here, we, we're located in King County. Um, and I had always assumed that we were always named after Dr. King, uh, forgetting that Dr. King was born in 1929, so it was a relatively new thing. And as I was doing my research, I, I found that the original King was uh, William R. King. Uh, William R. King was a slave owner from Florida who also served as the vice president of the United States under President Franklin Pierce. And we changed our name and our logo in 1986. But I was challenged this week thinking about what it means to name ourselves, to, to call ourselves after such a remarkable figure, and then to stop there. Hear me. Words and identity and values, how we declare who we are, how we declare who the other is, incredibly important. Again, words and identity and values are incredibly important. But what does it mean for us to claim that we follow the Christ and then to stop there? What does it mean for us to name that we are anti-racist and anti-ableist, that we welcome all people, and then to stop there. What does it mean for us to have a land acknowledgement in word only and to stop there? What does it mean to claim to care about gathering with one another, to claim to care about community, that we would care for one another, that we would support one another, and to stop there? How would our world change? How would our connections of love grow? How might we truly live into the people God calls us to be if we can just go beyond stopping there? 
My prayer for us is that as we reflect on the life and legacy of Dr. King, not just today and tomorrow, but hopefully throughout the year, that it wouldn't just stop with reflection, but that we would be able to see the impact that he had on our lives and our community in our life today, and then to carry it forward. Right, to, to continue to be the essence of love and justice so that we too might experience that dream firsthand, that we don't have to wait for some day way out there, but that we too might live into the dream where all God's children might declare free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we are free at last. Could we be that people? Could we be that people? Let's pray. God, we uh, give you thanks for this time together, for the opportunity to be gathered, to remember your faithfulness and to declare your goodness in our world. We thank you for the opportunity to be the people you call us to be. So inspire us to be bold. Inspire us to take that next step on the journey that we might experience little day after day after day the dream come into fruition where all might experience your love and your grace the welcoming and belonging into the beloved community. Thank you for the gift of our community. Help us to be your people. It's in Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen.